Hello again, welcome once again on my scientific channel Discover Social Sciences and this time I continue in this video with the teaching path uh, uh, about political systems. In my previous video, so the one political systems hashtag for I entered into like the most fundamental traits of electoral regimes and in this video, so political systems hashtag 5, I explore more in detail uh, the link between political power and electoral regimes under a specific angle. It is uh, in uh, my last video, so in the hashtag 4, uh, you could have seen that in constitutional systems, in that case, we studied, or I studied, the case of uh, Finland and its constitutional system. There is like a subtle link between the political power already in place, so between who is who in the political system, and the way that elections can unfold. And in this video, I am exploiting that link. Now, I would, as uh, those videos that I am publishing and those educational pieces of content which I publish under the general label of political systems, in those videos I am pretty straightforward in uh, serving my thoughts to, uh, to my students and to the general public. Now, before we go further, uh, just to give a context, in my own political views, I am pretty moderate. I am a centrist. But I am a centrist who is 52 of age at the moment of uh, making those videos. A centrist who was born and raised in a communist country, in the communist Poland. A centrist who has seen many transitions from one political regime to another one. So I am I would say that I have like a healthy dose of cynicism as it comes to political systems. I just know that politics are there because they work essentially as unfair, as brutal as politics could seem. They are a social structure, a way of being together, which generally works. Huh? As any social structure, politics can get out of control. We can have anarchy or we can have an authoritarian regime. We can have a dictatorship or a, uh, or a violent revolution. But these are outliers. So my general message to students who follow that path of teaching of mine about political systems is to look at political systems precisely as at something that works, as something that we have learned over centuries to make work to essentially the benefit of all the people involved. Uh, if a political system seems uh, unfair or even brutal, it doesn't mean that it is a, the wrong system. It is just one among many systems there are. Okay, uh, so let's go in this specific presentation so about the connection uh, between electoral regimes and political power. Okay, I go to my beloved PowerPoint and here is the first point, so like the, the introduction. I gave it um, a title. On the whole, it is easier to win elections than winning a war. And it is like a basic thing to remember about, poli uh, about democracies in general and about electoral regimes in democracies more specifically. It is essentially like a discovery that we humans made over time that uh, clever use of democratic institutions is much more functional than the use of force and violence. 
In this slide, I even put that sentence that even if I plan to become an autocratic tyrant, it is much easier to get there by winning elections and subsequently exploiting that victory than to wage and win a war. It is just, at the bottom line, it can be said that it is just about money. It is much cheaper to win an electoral campaign and it is much cheaper and safer to influence gently the way that an electoral regime works than to engage military effort or like a guerrilla effort of comparable size and scope. Politics are an excellent example of that saying that violence is the last resort of helplessness. In politics, I become violent, I use force when I essentially don't know what else to do. Uh, and now something that could seem cynical, but it is a claim which I can substantiate. So officially, we tend to see electoral regimes in democracies as something that gives power to the people. To some extent, it is true, yes. But uh, there is a brutal truth about political systems, that political power is true power and is workable as a social structure when it is concentrated in the hands of few and used to impact the actions of many. Political power that would be like perfectly dispersed across a population would be inefficient political power. As soon as you go above the scale of a nation like, let's say, Iceland, uh, political power just has to be concentrated, has to be agglomerated in the hands of few in order to be an efficient tool of social organization. Hmm? So, here I remind uh, that table uh, I uh, placed in my last presentation, so in political systems hashtag 4. It is the table which just, which let's say structures the forms of uh, political power. And the central thought that I will be developing across this video is that electoral victory gives political legitimation gives and in turn gives direct or indirect access to all the basic forms of political power. So once you have learned how to win elections, you can stay in power. This is that loop that power makes electoral victory and electoral victory makes power. And here I exploit like the, or I ex explore, ex excuse me, I use the wrong word, not exploit, I explore the four uh, substances of political power, which I explain more in detail in my previous video. So just to remind you, there are those four manifestations of political power the capacity to create or modify the rules of the game or legal systems, the power to appoint people to political roles, the power to allocate capital and the power to use coercive force. And I will shortly highlight the, co the connection between electoral regimes and the possibility to use each of those four manifestations of political power. I start from the top so from the creation or modification of the institutional order. And there is a fact that virtually all electoral regimes are partly regulated by the constitution and partly by parliamentary acts. You could see such a situation in my last video where I was discussing the case of Finland. Some electoral regulations are in the Constitution and some others are in a parliamentary act, the Election Act. Now, if you think about it, constitutions usually require a lot of 
effort and a lot of procedures to be changed. For example, in most European countries, it's a common thing that if you want to change the constitution, you need either a referendum, which means that you generally have to run elections in favor of your view of the constitution, or you, in, in, in some countries, you can change the constitution by mastering a big qualified majority of at least 66%, in some cases, 70 of at least 75% of votes in the combined houses of the parliament. And if you look across the board, if you look at the composition of uh, parliaments in different countries, you can easily see that uh, a majority of 66% or even more a majority of 75% in like a normally governed democratic country, it is almost unrealistic to get. So changing a constitution is hard, but changing the fine details of electoral regimes by parliamentary acts, it is much, it is much, e e it is much simpler and let's say much easier. Because then, if you change the electoral regime or the fine proceedings, the specific details of the electoral regime by a parliamentary act, it essentially means that the ruling majority in the country changes the, the way of running the next elections. So the parliament, the parliamentary majority can very largely uh, define the rules that they will play by in the next elections. Uh, and here I send you once again to the last presentation, the hashtag 4, uh, because uh, here one of the core components of those electoral regimes that political parties like to meddle with in those parliamentary acts is the so-called quantitative representation. Uh, I remind you that quantitative representation, at least in my world, in my, um, in my vocabulary for that lecture of political systems, means the average number of votes a candidate needs to be elected. Uh, because this shapes political strategies in electoral campaigns. And this, in turn, is indirectly regulated by the definition of constituencies, voting districts, and by the rules that uh, uh, govern the allotment of seats in the parliament among voting districts and or among constituencies. The next thing is the power to appoint people to political roles. Uh, as regards, and here I am referring to one specific thing, uh, to the fact that elections de facto are made of those two phases. There is one phase that we can see, this is the phase when we vote, and the phase which precedes that one, the phase when candidates are being nominated. You know that when you vote, you vote on people on a list. Huh? So now we question the way of making those lists. If you look across the board, if you compare different countries as for their electoral regimes, you can see that there is like a very fluid and fine line between regulations of uh, nominations of candidates to be found in the constitution itself on the one hand and those to be found in parliamentary acts that regulate the fine detail. Essentially, we could say that the more specific is the constitution, strictly spoken, as regards the nomination of candidates for election, the less power is in the hands of political parties. But the more general is the constitution, so the more political parties have to say as for the detailed procedures of nominating candidates, the more power is in the hands of those political parties. So in, 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 in many countries, for example, in the United States, you have a situation when you essentially cannot run for any serious office in the political system in, to any serious elected 
mandate if you don't have the blessing of one of the two big parties, the Democrats or the Republicans. Huh? Uh, so that uh, that right to nominate or the position of political parties in the nomination of candidates for elections it is a huge power. Uh, personally, I think that uh, in practice it is like the most steerable, the most flexible power that political parties have in order to like stay in the game and exclude all the challengers, all the outsiders to. The, uh, to that political game. Now, the, for, uh, the third form of uh, the influence or the, uh, the third form of the power to fine-tune electoral regimes is money, so allocation of capital. And here I more specifically refer to the way that political parties and individual candidates in elections can be financed. In most countries, in practically all the constitutional systems I know, there, are, there is some kind of regulations as regards the possibility to acquire money for doing politics. For example, in many countries, including Poland, political parties which have their representation in the parliament, so political parties which have successfully placed their people in, their parliament, in the parliament, are entitled to receive budgetary subsidies. And essentially, the more people they have in the parliament, the greater subsidy they receive. So you can see the rules of the game here. The more successful we have been in the last elections, the more money we receive from the taxpayers' money, and uh, consequently, the more money we have to set the stage and to run electoral campaigns for the next elections. It is like a loop. Huh? The more established a political party is in the existing political landscape, the greater chances they have to be, uh, to be elected again or to win again. And now, um, of course, uh, there is a strong ar arg argument which has a strong substance that if we subsidize political parties from the budget, they can uh, require from them perfect financial transparency so or more financial transparency because as they uh, receive budgetary subsidies they have to disclose their financial accounts huh? because they need to show how they used those subsidies so yes there is that other side of the coin that the budgetary subsidies can serve to control the way that political parties spend money another thing or another important point is the rules, the legal rules that regulate uh, uh, the uh, private donations, especially donations from business entities to political parties and to individual candidates or to individual electoral committees. Uh, essentially, the more freedom political parties and political candidates have to receive private donations, the more independent financially they are from the government actually in place. So the more freedom in receiving private donations, the greater likelihood that there will be a change in the political landscape. Uh, that a new party or a new candidate can muster sufficiently much private capital for their, uh, for their electoral campaign to like shake off the system. So we have those, let's say, two alternative systems with strong budgetary subsidies for political parties and uh, limited capacity to receive private donations. And that system contributes to like maintaining the existing the existing landscape, or we have or we can have a system more focused on the financing from private sources, and this is likely to be more flexible. 
Now, finally, the fourth form of uh, political powers, uh, the form substance of political power, so the capacity to use coercive force. And now there is an interesting thing about it. And uh, here I connect to that logic I introduced in the beginning of that presentation. Like the big discovery that we made over centuries in our political strategies is that the use of force is probably the least efficient way of doing politics. Force is mostly useful when people are afraid that you can use it. But once you actually start using coercive force, it is much less powerful as a political tool. Uh, in politics, especially if you are an like already incumbent political party, if you are al already in power or in a position of power, on the long run, it really pays more to use coercive force just for upholding law and order rather than for targeting political opponents. It is because when you want to win elections, it is to remember that unless we have a very deep and widespread social unrest in the country, most voters just like seeing law and order around them. And I like it too, by the way. And they are like willing to vote for someone as long as they see that that someone, that the candidate or the political party can assure law and order. So using co coercive force in a targeted way to target political opponents, it is a tricky game in po politics. And this is probably the reason why most political prayers in the world avoid doing it. Huh? Now, I, I know that uh, uh, you can quote me examples, for example, like China. Yes, in China, you can see the government uh, coming very hard on uh, political opponents, but they come hard with coercive force on political opponents that you can see protesting in the street. Now, I am going to say something horrible, but something which I deeply believe in. Those people that you can see protesting in Chinese streets, for example, in Hong Kong, they don't count as a political power in China, in the specifically Chinese realities. The real political players in China are inside the Communist Party, inside the structures of, of the Communist Party. And I can tell you, as far as I know, the political reality in China, for any political Chinese leader, it would be a very complicated way of committing political suicide if they decided to use force and uh, forceful repression against their political opponents inside the party. Inside the party, you play by the book. Huh? You don't use force against your opponents inside the party. You can use force against people who are in the street and who, once again, it is horribly brutal what I am uh, going to say, but these people, from the point of view of the Chinese political game, they are just useful idiots. So I can use force against them, but not against my true political opponents. And the truly authoritarian regimes can be easily recognized when, in the wake of elections, you can see candidates of the opposition suddenly being arrested, being fined. That's something you can see in, in Belarus, for example, something you can sometimes see in the Russian Federation, in Hungary. That's like a subtle sign that the political system is drifting or is all, all, already in the universe of authoritarian rule. Okay, that would be all in that presentation. Uh, so, once again, it was about the connection between electoral regimes and political power. And once again, I am renewing a sort of uh, 
recommendation which I already made in my last video in political regimes hashtag four. Uh, do your own research. When you follow those videos, especially if you are a student of mine in the course of political systems, when you have watched a video, Google up things that you are interested in. Try to like map the problems we are talking about. Okay, so that would be it. Uh, I invite you to visit from time to time my website discoversocialsciences.com and as usually I wish you to have fun with science and to have fun with life. Bye.